Good day, this is Jim Pytel from Columbia Gorge Community College. This is Digital Electronics. This lecture is entitled Memory Basics. Okay, we are not going to go into great detail about memory. We're going to keep this on a pretty general level of discussion. The reason why is most of you are probably familiar with modern memory and storage being computer literate. And second, if I went into any specific technical details, the moment I publish this thing on the internet, it would be instantly outdated because there is a rapid change in memory and storage technology. And I'm going to go ahead and try to keep this in a very, very general terminology. We remember from our previous unit about registers, registers, the major application for registers is memory. However, they're really kind of only used for small scale memory. They're not intended for large term storage, nor are they intended to store large quantities of data. What they're kind of viewed as is those temporary and not a lot sticky notes you use to remind yourself. And they're typically found in an interaction between real memory and a bus. Say, for example, I wanted to read the specific contents of a memory, I would place it onto a register from real memory, then the register interacts with the bus. This is a temporary stage. A write operation would be absolutely opposite, where the register is taking information from the bus and storing it onto true memory. So what memory really is, its description is to be the permanent or semi-permanent storage of data. In reality, everything's semi-permanent, but there are things that are more permanent than others. And there are two terminologies used, memory versus storage. So memory is typically defined as RAM versus ROM memory. We'll go into the specifics of those. Whereas storage, that's kind of defined as those things that are removable, for lack of a better description. So like think about a magnetic hard drive, like an optical-based CD or a DVD. Think about those flash drives that you guys are constantly losing in the lab. Think about the SD card, um, the compact flash card, and any new means of storage that's currently out right now. What is it storing? Well, it's storing the smallest unibinary information a bit. You can basically store it a zero or a one. They are typically packaged in groups. A package of eight bits is called a byte. And there are other terminologies associated with this. And for lack of a better word, the word is a package of bytes. There could be a two byte word, a four byte word, so on and so forth. Basically, it's a grouping of bytes. And now talk about memory arrays, think about it. it's a physical arrangement because these are physical devices. It's a physical arrangement where you put those bits and those bytes and those words. And the terminology that's co commonly used is this little b for a bit, the big b for byte. And before we go into some of this terminology here is there are certain things that should be sacred. One of them is the metric system. And the prefixes within those metric system, to me, should mean the same thing between different disciplines. However, and I kind of see the point, there is a schism between computer and the SI speak. Okay, And that schism occurs with the definition of K. If we remember right, the scientific, excuse me, uh, the SI system has a prefix of K, which typically means a thousand. So for example, km, kilometer. How many meters is it? It's a thousand meters. Okay, so it's the, what that K means, it's a thousand. In computer speak, however, it means 1024. Okay, the reason why is because 1024, it's a power of two. So a KB, one KB with a big B, it's actually 1024 bytes. Dig it? So there is, if you're truly running the numbers, they're always in powers of two. So for example, a 16 KB memory in reality has 16,380. 84 bytes in it, but it's typically expressed as 16K. Same thing with a 32KB memory. Well, it's really 32,768. A 64KB memory, it is 65,536. You don't need to memorize these things, but realize that what they're trying to do in this computer speak, it's basically trying to get it into powers of tooth. Look at those lead numbers. 16, 32, 64, 128, 512, assume 256, 512, so on and so forth. And then what happens is basically you step back up into the next range where it's one mega. So what is one mega? Well, it's 1024 KBs. What's it 
what's that? It's 1,024 times 1,024 bytes, which in reality is 1,048,576 bytes. But realize that prefix stays the same. It's one. For computer speak purposes, you're keeping it powers of two. So let's just do this one more example. One gigabyte, it's 1,024 megabytes, which in reality is 1,024 times 1,024 kilobytes, which in reality is 1,024 times 1,024 times 1,024 bytes, which is that big old number right there. 1,073,000. 741,824 bytes. But all you do is just take that first number and call it a giga, one gigabyte. So in addition to this whole numerical schism that's occurred between SI and computer speak, the whole time I've been talking about is basically the number of words and the word length. What's the word length I've been referring to this whole time? A byte. So a gigabyte, it's one billion 73,741,824 packages of 8 bits. Anytime you have a memory array, it's typically referred as the number of words and the word length. Okay, so gigabyte. It's a billion bytes. Well, for our intents and purposes, a billion bytes. Like I said, there are physical arrangements because these are physical things. You have to arrange them. And there's two ways of thinking about how these things are arranged. And what you can think of is the first one is what I call is the row approach. Say, for example, I've got rows and I've got columns. For byte arrangements, what I've got is eight columns, whereby all those ones and zeros can go in there. And how I address what's in that particular, that particular byte, it's just the row number. So I've got row number zero, one, two, three, four, five, so on and so forth, all going down in a row. So whereas the columns in this particular case, that's actually the byte of information, whereas the row is addressing that whole byte. And think about what I'm doing here. It's I'm talking about two terms now, and they're mutually exclusive. They're not describing each other. I'm describing the address, i.e. where in this physical arrangement is that particular byte of interest. And the second thing I'm describing is what's in that byte of interest. So this particular byte right here may have the contents, for example, the number nine, eight bit representation of nine. It is the contents of that. That's the data. Whereas its address is row zero. And let's say it is in an arrangement of like, let's say eight rows. So six, seven. So what it stand to conjecture, the address for that to represent eight rows, I'd have to have a three bit representation. So the address has a particular number and the data, it's the contents of what's in that address. Say for example, in address one, I have stored the number two. So it's again, it's address data. Data, it's the contents of that row. Address, what's the row, all right? There's an alternate way of describing a physical arrangement of these. Let's go ahead and clean up this definition first. So the alternate method of describing the address and the physical arrangement of a memory is this row and column format. And this is very similar to the streets and avenue arrangement of pretty much every city on earth except Salt Lake, which has other problems of far greater magnitude than its bizarre street and address naming convention. Avenues and streets, that's what it is. Rows and columns. And if you can imagine, now the data is stored in buildings at the intersection of that avenue and street or at the intersection of that row and column. So for example, here's my start point. I go down a number of rows and then I go over a certain number of columns and my data is stored in this particular case in an 8-bit high building. So what is that? Well, that's one byte. So the building is one byte high. If you're storing them in, let's say, two byte words, well, think about it. It's a taller building. And these inner, um, this physical range between rows and columns versus just rows, they're really kind of interchangeable. But realize that certain devices address, there's a row number and column number, whereas other devices are just row numbers. Okay, some primitive devices are just row. All right, so we've described the basic 
physical arrangement of these things. And again, that 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 row and column thing, it's still kind of the same thing as that row. Basically, I have an address, which is, let's say, that's row three, zero, one, one, and it's column two. So my address is, let's just say we the naming convention is row, then column. So that's my address. What's the contents of that? Let's say it's the number nine, eight bit representation representation of nine. So now that we've gone over the physical arrangement of these things, the row definition versus the row and column definition, let's talk about reading and writing to memory and using these registers and data buses. We're going to have to expand our definition previously. All we had previously in our block diagram was a memory feeding to a register, feeding to a bus. Okay, we've got to expand that definition a little bit. Here's a very, very simple block diagram representing an interaction between this memory and this register. The black representation of those black lines, what that is, that's the data bus. We've got another bus here. What is that? That's the address bus. And this third bus is what's known as the control bus. Okay, and these are very, very, very simplistic diagrams. And like I said previously, for memory to work, it has to have data and it has to have a location within that memory to store that data. So any interaction between memory and another device, you need to have a means to put the data and you have to have a means of telling the memory where the data is. Additionally, you have to have a means of controlling it. Are you writing to it? Or are you reading from it? So there are these three level of ac actions here. What's the data? What's the information? What's the address? Where is it? The control, what's it doing? Is it writing or reading? So from the data bus here, the black one, I've got memory. When it is writing, basically what it's doing, it's taking data from the data bus, storing it onto the register. Data is coming into that register. There's an address on the address bus. And be aware there may be an address register in here too. So it's taking that address from the address register. And then there's a control. It says write. And there may be control registers too in between to store some of this, the interaction that either connect or disconnect be those via those tri-state buffers. And at that time when the control says, okay, good, write this data, the number nine, write the number nine to address three. What's going to happen is it's going to go to address three and it's going to write the number nine. Opposite world. We're going to go ahead and read. Okay, so in a read operation here, where are we going to read from? Realize the data bus at this point is blank. There's nothing in there. Okay, there's nothing in that data register, whereas previously there was something in there. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and have an address from our bus placed into that memory register. And then we're going to go ahead and tell the control, I want you to read. So those registers, if they exist, are sent to this memory device, at which point it says, okay, let's say the address was three. So it says, go to three, read it. And what to do? It spits out the number nine. Okay, because that's what we stored in there last time. And the number nine is placed into that register as an intermediary, basically copying the contents of that memory onto the register. And then the register is dumping it onto the data bus. Be aware this is a non-destructive read. It's like copying the contents of the memory into the register. That number nine in address three is still there. That register, yeah, that can be wiped out the next time for the next operation, next read or write operation. But that contents of address three in that particular memory is still there. And for the most part, it's going to stay there until you turn the thing off. And that is a major difference here between RAM and ROM. RAM and ROM, random access memory, and ROM is read-only memory. But realize both of them are random access. When they say random access, what I mean is, is basically all data in any address is accessible in an equal amount of time and can be accessed in any order. What I'm saying is to think about a big book or a big tape of information. For you to get information at a specific point in that book, you got to turn to that book or wind to that section of a tape. I don't know if you guys ever remember like VCRs or VHS, you would wind to that particular point. So basically it would be, it would take longer to access there. Whereas RAM versus ROM, the random access portion of that, it means it can, ra it can access anything, anywhere at any time in the same amount of time. Okay. The difference really in the acronyms here is basically ROM, read 
only read only. You can only read it. it for the most part, is permanent or semi-permanent, i.e. it cannot be written to normal circumstances. It is non-volatile. Think of the term volatile organic compounds. I think about a paint that gives off a lot of gaseous substances. Non-volatile. It's not going to disappear. Mask ROM, that's what you typically think of as ROM. Mask ROM is manufactured. Think about ones and zeros engraved into a tiny, tiny, tiny stone put in your computer, and you cannot erase it. Whereas there's these other things called electrically erasable, programmable read-only memories. You can sometimes electrically erase them or UV erase them. These things are programmable read-only memories, and you can custom program them, but however, they're not normally written to in normal circumstances. Once you write it, you just kind of leave it alone. The benefit of ROM, however, is when you turn this off and you turn it back on, the memory is still there. In contrast to RAM, random access memory, it is volatile. So whereas ROM has the the advantage of its non-volatile, but it's the disadvantage that you cannot write to it in normal circumstances. RAM has the advantage that you can write and read it, but the disadvantage that it is volatile. Okay, so you turn off RAM, it's gone. You can, however, write to it. Okay, so for our previous example, where we are writing and reading to this memory via the interaction of the data, address, and control bus. Obviously, we're talking about RAM. If we're writing to this thing, we're talking about RAM. If we are reading only, that's RAM. All right, so uh, there. Uh, let's talk about RAM. There are several different styles of RAM, and the big delineation is SRAM and DRAM. SRAM stands for static. DRAM stands for dynamic. So static, uh, imagine the term static. You don't have to do nothing with it. Once you put that one in there, it's going to stay in there. Once you put that zero in there, it's going to stay in there. Whereas dynamic, you put a one and a z and or a zero in a DRAM device, it means you have to refresh it. So there is some refresh circuitry that goes along with this. And SRAM, you do not need to know the internal comp uh, components of SRAM for this particular course, nor do you need to know the internal components of a DRAM. SRAM, what it really is, is it's kind of cross-coupled field effect transistors. When you put a one in there, it's going to be fine. And put a zero in there, it's going to be fine. Where DRAM, it's made out of capacitors. What do capacitors do? They charge up and discharge. So realize if these little tiny capacitors are discharging at a slow rate, slow rate, you might have to go ahead and refresh them. So there's some additional refresh circuitry that has to go with a DRAM. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of them? Well, SRAM is typically faster. However, it's larger. DRAM, it's a little bit slower, but it's smaller. So depends upon your particular application, you might want an SRAM or DRAM, or sometimes what's known as cache. Okay, so what is cache? L1, L2, so on and so forth. Cache memory, think of the term cache, a cache of weaponry, a cache of food, um, a cache of tools. You know, it's something you need very often. Well, hopefully not a lot of weaponry. Uh, the analogy that some people use is the refrigerator. The cache, that's your refrigerator. That's food items you constantly use, whereas real memory might be the grocery store. You could have SRAM cache, but have DRAM RAM. That cache is basically, it's memory, extremely fast memory that is extremely close at hand. What it often is built to do, it's actually built into the microprocessor. So you've got this microprocessor and you've got your L1 cache right there. Super, super fast, super expensive, but not a lot of it. You might have L2 cache, which is not as fast, not as expensive, but still substantially faster than your your RAM memory, which might be DRAM based. So sometimes you want extremely fast access for TED, potentially for a lot smaller contents of data. And where do you want to locate it? Right at hand. So whereas ROM is non-volatile, but I can only read from it. RAM is volatile, and I can write and read to it. There is this new type of memory, which is called flash memory. Okay, flash memory kind of combines the advantages of both of these. What is flash memory? Well, think about it. It's non-volatile, and you can write and read to it. Where I said previously is devices that are called storage. This is awesome. It's a no moving parts. It's a flash drive. I can also even make basically a solid state drive. Drive 
and we'll talk about storage in a little bit here, I can actually make a hard drive out of flash memory. And what is flash memory? It's field effect transistors that can have a non-volatile storage of a one or zero. So before we go into some of the other topics in this memory basics, I just I, you, again, you do not need to know the internal workings of these particular cells, SRAM, DRAM, or flash. But in its most basic form, you've got a cell, okay, a memory cell. What is a memory cell? Well, in SRAM, it's cross-coupled field effect transistors. What is it in DRAM? It's some field effect transistors and some capacitors. In flash, it's also field effect transistors, but externally, it's all kind of the same. You've got this select, you've got an in, and you've got an out. So what do you do to write something? Well, you select it and put either a zero or a one on it. Let's say I've stored a zero. Now what do I do to read it? I select it, and then I read it from the output. It's that simple. DRAM, realize that there is some refresh circuitry that will have to go on to this here. You know, say for example, at a certain point, I've gone ahead and selected it and stored a one in it. And let's say it's not being used there. I'm going to go ahead to refresh that one. I'm going to have to select it, then refresh it on a pretty consistent basis if I want that one to consistently stay in there. And here's an extremely primitive arrangement of two four bit rows. What do I want to do? Let's say I want to store a particular number in row zero. I select that row and I go ahead and store the number using these ins from a register. Okay, let's go let's say I want to go ahead and read a number. Okay, let's say I want to go ahead and read a number from a particular row, in this case row zero, or excuse me, row one. I'm going to go ahead and read the contents of that to the register. So in a row column arrangement, realize that there is a row select and a column select. It might look something like this. So what it would be, it would be select row zero, column one. And basically this device is activated now. And what is that device? Well, think about it. It's a building that might be eight bits high or four bits high or 32 bits high. And the contents of that register is dumped into or read from. So some of the remaining topics here is think of the term memory expansion. There's two ways of doing this. Is basically I can expand the word length or I can extend expand the word capacity. And there are two two associated properties with that. If I'm expanding the word length, I've got more data. Say for example a number. I've got an eight bit word. It's a byte. Whereas I'm going to now a 16-bit word, I could represent a larger range of numbers. Okay, so that's more data. I've got double the amount of information I can put in there. Versus word capacity, that means there's more addresses. Basically, my city expands. The size of the buildings stay the same, but there's more buildings up there. I think about that is whereas previously word length, basically I just made the same number of buildings except the buildings are taller now. Whereas word capacity, I just added more buildings, but they're all the same height sprawling out like Vancouver, Washington. So storage. Okay, we've previously discussed storage here. What is storage? It's typically done on a disk and a disk drive. It's a physical device that is driven, okay, that is spun. And it's a physical arrangement of things. A disk is obviously circular in nature. And there are these sectors. They're kind of like slices of pie. And then there are tracks, okay, the circular, the, excuse me, the cylindrical, I guess, path. So when you store data to it, as opposed to that rows and columns arrangement on a disk drive, it's typically stored in sector two, track 13. It's a, the track is the circular ring, whereas the sector is the slice of the pie. Okay, it's a physical arrangement. And like a physical arrangement, think about a disk drive. It's spinning at incredibly rapid speed. And what is reading it? It's this head, this magnetic that can read and write magnetism on it. And it's skimming above the surface of this hard drive at exceptionally, exceptionally small distances. And think about any wobble of that disk. Let's say you're moving this computer around. Um, you know, you got your computer on your motorcycle as you're doing a heel clicker over a 60 foot jump. What's going to happen is, is that head is going to hit that drive like 2,300 RPM ice cream scoop. It's going to gouge out that hard drive. That is a common mode of hard drive failure is just don't move it while it's being accessed. So one of the ways you could potentially resolve some of this is via optical. What is a CD or a DVD? Well, it's still a disc. It's just using light. What is it reading? It's reading these lands and pits. 
okay, what's a pit? It's a zero, and a land is no pit, so zeros and ones. Uh, whereas a solid state drive it has the terminology drive in it, but it's not drive in nothing. It's really just a giant collection of flash memory. And what's really neat about that, like I said, there's no moving parts, non-volatile, and it can be written and read from. And what's awesome is they're getting cheaper. Okay, solid states drive. It's not driving anything. There's no moving parts. But because people want to have this terminology between hard drive, now I've got a solid state drive. There are a couple fixed function devices that you may run across. You may never run across, who knows? But there's some pretty neat things for some lab activities. The first off is a 74189. What this is, is a 4-bit tri-state RAM. And it has 16 rows. Basically, it can store 16 four bit words and how this thing is interact how you interact with this is like i said previously obviously there is an address and there is data 16 rows four bit addresses four bit data there's four input bits and finally what's the third thing we need we've got our address we've got our data what's the third thing we need control what's its control well it has this thing called chip enable and read Chip enables active low. So when you have a low on chip enable, the chip is enabled. Read write, that's the mode selection. When it is in read mode, it's a one. When it's in write mode, it's a zero. R, not W. So when it's a zero, it's writing. When it's a reading, it's a one. And the truth table here is really easy to understand. When the chip is not enabled, don't do nothing. Inhibit, it's a high Z out. When I am, let's say, let's go ahead and write operation first. When the chip is enabled, and I'm writing to it, basically this data, D right here, is stored at this address. And what's the output? Well, I'm writing to it, so leave me alone. Don't. I'm just still trying to do something here, basically what I'm saying. The output is still a high Z, because I'm in write mode. Don't read from me, because I don't have valid data. Yet. Now in read mode. Okay, what is read mode? Well, basically, you go ahead and enable the chip, obviously, and then you want to read from it. What is the read? Well, basically it's going to read the contents of what you put on that address. So the D inputs have no, there's no inputs to them anymore. Basically I have to tell it, read, give it a valid address, what appears at the output, an active low representation of what you put in there. That's why no one uses 74 and 189. So what it does, it takes the complement of your stored data. So yeah, it's slightly confusing, but what is it? It's the stored data. All it's doing is putting it in active low terms. Okay, so if I store 1001, what would I get out? I would get 0110. Here's another really cool fixed function device, the CAT22C10. This is a really, really, really neat chip here. The reason why it's really neat is because, whereas previously the 74189, I had a data input and a data output here. Look at this. I've got input, output. This is a really neat device because you know, you're simplifying that arrangement of your interaction perhaps with a bus system. Whereas previously 74189, I would have to have an input door, an input bus, and an output bus. Okay, so what I've got here now is this single input output. When it's in input mode, when it's in write mode, obviously it acts as an input. When it's in read mode, those same pins act as an output. Another reason why this device is pretty neat it is not in a row format, it's in a row column format. So it's obviously got an address, and I've got a row, three bit row, three bit column. Think about that, what is it? It's eight rows, eight columns. How much data can I store in here? Well, if I can store four bits at each location, what is that? That's 64 four bit words, or 256 total bits. What was the 74189 storage? Well, it's got 16 rows of four bits. So it's 64 bits. And you've got this annoying active low output. So the CAT22C10 has some pretty neat features on it. You got your input output, you got your row and column, but I am just getting started on how cool this thing is. It's got volatile operation, like we've been talking about, RAM and ROM. This is going to be RAM. And it has non-volatile operations, i.e. ROM mode. What's really neat is behind the RAM, behind every single address data position there, there is also ROM. And what you can do is store something to this thing's RAM and then enter a non-volatile operation, basically write 
the contents. Store SRAM to the electrically erasable programmable read-only memory. And then turn the thing off. And what's neat is you go ahead and have done this thing. You store whatever you had in SRAM to the ROM, turn it off, and then you show up to lab the next day, recall. Basically, you take the ROM and put it to SRAM, and you've got what you had in there previously. So it's this really neat device that you can potentially have volatile in the form of SRAM and non-volatile in this form of this electrically erasable programmable read-only memory below. Okay, so how does the truth table for these things work here? Obviously, chip select when I'm not selecting it. It don't matter whether you're writing or reading. It's output high Z. It's disconnected using those tri-state buffers. If I am chip selecting it and I am not write enabling, basically I need a zero for it to write. Basically what I'm going to do, I'm going to read. I'm reading the contents of that address at particular column and row intersection, that four bit number, which I put in there. Finally, if I am chip selecting it and I do want to enable writing, what am I doing? I'm writing to it. I'm taking that input and writing it to that address. And what am I storing? It's a four bit quantity of data at such and such address. So non-volatile operations, what is, let's say I've gone ahead and I've stored all this information that I want in my SRAM, I'm going to go ahead and say store. Basically, I'm going to bring that store pin to a low. It will store all the contents there. And let's say I want to go ahead and come back, turn it off. All I do is just recall, give a zero on the recall pin, and it recalls the contents of the electrically erasable programmable read-only memory to SRAM. And be aware that there is a priority given to this signal. Let's say if I'm simultaneously storing and recalling, which doesn't make sense, recall has priority. So let's conclude this lecture of memory basics here with uh, just a little word about their practical limitations to these devices. Like I said about writing and reading these things, it has to have a valid address. Obviously, you cannot give a 74189 an address beyond 16. You have to have a valid address, you have to have valid data, and realize that there is. it takes time for these things to access the address. It takes time for these things to read the data. So there is basically these address access times, a write cycle time. What is a write cycle time? Well, basically, the time it takes for a complete section of data to be written to a specific address. And within that write cycle time, there are certain times, okay, you've got to show the address, a valid address for a specific amount of time. And you've got to go ahead and have valid data shown for a specific amount of time. And then you've got to go ahead and have your control signals available for a specific amount of time. It's not like you can just do these flashcard things like you did in fourth grade where the teacher just flashes up a two plus two and throws it back down and you're expected to come up with the answer. These things have practical limitations that, okay, the address needs to be there for a certain number of milliseconds. The data needs to be there for a certain number of milliseconds. The control signal needs to be there for a certain number of milliseconds. And as you'll find out, specific order, which is pretty annoying, and you got to go ahead and for that full write cycle to be complete. Same thing for a read cycle. You've got to have a valid address. You've got to have valid control inputs, and you've got to have a valid time to allow that data to be retrieved. For example, it's like the, the librarian. You go to the librarian, you say, hey, I want such and such book, and that librarian is going to take some time to go ahead and get it back. It's not like these things are instantaneously available. They're extremely fast, but be aware that there are practical limitations. This concludes the memory basic lecture. Like I said, I've published this thing. It is instantly outdated. There's probably something new and fancy out there, but I certainly hope the basic interaction between this bus structure here is still relevant to you today. Data, that's the contents of it. Address, that's where it is. And control, whether you read it or write it or any other various operations perhaps the coordination of different devices. Okay, so there are three different buses, data, address, and control. Okay, this concludes uh, the memory basics.